Sue uh, along for you in our Sydney CBD studio for our CEO of XM Group. Pete, warm welcome to the show. Again, it's this overlay and we've got to tick off iron ore as well, but let's first off start with the energy piece. Uh, again, it looks as if path of least resistance is yet again downward. Uh, what, are the, what are those catalysts that are playing out to suggest that? Well, good afternoon, Carson and team. You know, when you look at the numbers, Carson, you've only got to take on board exploration costs and what we're looking at as far as where the energy market is. Uh, I think there's a lot of uh, conjecture at the moment. People are saying that it's fairly well grown. It's exhausted a little bit, and I think it'll probably trim back a bit from here. And if you're looking at the big picture, exploration is down 45% as far as costs since 2013. So. We've found the least amount of oil outside the USA, wait for this, since 1952. <laughs> so that gives you some sort of an idea. Well, that would imply some d degree of concern over meeting demands. Uh, and when does that shoot home? Well, when you exactly right. So what happens in five to ten years moving forward from here, and then you've got a great issue ahead. Yeah, this is a once in a generation slump as far as that price correction down to that $25, $26 a level for WTI only a couple of months back and what effect it's having. So you, yes, you're exactly right. What happens in years to come and the only winners I suppose are the shareholders in the sense the likes of uh, Royal Dutch Shell, BP and Group. What they're all doing of course is cutting staff costs and cutting exploration and making sure that you've got still a healthy dividend back to shareholders. No one's talking at the moment about China's energy needs and a tilt on any of these plays uh, that, are, that are the said household names right now. Is that to you an outlier option on, on the sector that there could be a flurry care of Chinese energy security shoring it up at these levels? Well, probably right, yes. I wouldn't be surprised. Also, carrying on from last week, what we discussed as far as India, uh, but then you look at the big picture. I mean, if you're looking across the, cro across the commodity sector, you've seen big washouts over the last matter of weeks. We've got rubber prices down over 20% on Tokyo, mm -hmm. uh, futures that is, in the last month. You've got iron ore that, and, and certainly steel prices well down. But yes, if you're looking at energy, I think that uh, you know, China and India are going to be main you know, demand drivers over the years ahead. And then and, and they've, they've got the cash to splash moreover, right? I mean, well, the... certainly at these cheap prices. Yeah. It's been one, one of the few saving graces for oil demand over the past years. There's been a lot of strategic supply build up going on in China and yeah. pretty opportunistic timing from my perspective. Pete, just this whole, I read some extraordinary numbers uh, last week about the gambling that's been going on in the commodities yeah. space in China and how much of it's happening at a mum and dad level. Now, billions of dollars and multiples of the actual physical market. Yeah. Is that what's driving these dramatic short-term movements or are there underlying reasons for it as well? Well, Steve, I think, you know, if you're looking at rebar, you're looking at what's happening across the ore sector, absolutely, and copper. Uh, we all know that the Chinese have got a very, very strong love affair with derivatives and of course FX trading and anything that shows leverage and to put that in some sort of number uh, they have a Shanghai FX conference or, or um, you know uh, it's three day event and we had 225,000 people attend this year so that gives you an idea just for one city so it's a very very big game they play and of course when you couple that with leverage and those huge market moves yeah they're all over it so was Anthony I think Robbins that that there about it was Anthony Robbins there just uh, doing, doing, doing his thing doing his routine it may well have been Carson <laughs> but it's interesting that we think of the Chinese financial markets as a lot less sophisticated than our own, but the average retail person can't access iron ore futures in Australia, right? It's not something that you go and no, say, well, I'm going to go and punt on iron ore. Isn't, yeah. isn't that, isn't that the, the, the question about when we do free trade agreements, what we're trying to say is one of the things we want to do is export the sophistication of wealth products. And, and what it is, is you are saying, I don't know that you need to be punting iron ore. I don't yeah. think that's the way to do it. And I don't think that's good over the long term because essentially uh, you know that casino isn't the right way to build wealth. And you've got property and cash really as genuine long-term investing options in China and maybe it is that lack of sophistication that's driving the gambling on. Yeah, is there superannuation products, is there a whole array of different, because what's happening is when you hear they're repoing their copper holdings mm. and you go, exactly. who, who is doing this? This is just <laughs> yeah. like, yeah. and how do you regulate this and how do you how do you make sure that everything doesn't blow up? And, and you know, Pete, I'm sure that the Chinese don't want it to blow up, so, no. you know, I guess it's there's more and more going on. Uh, what's happening in Saudi? I'm looking at some of the stuff in Saudi. Last we spoke, there was a potential listing in the Saudi Arabian oil company. Is that still yeah. on the chart? Yeah, it's still going. I mean, they're still talking about that, Mark. You know, we're around about a 2%. 
3% sort of number. It'll probably increase as the years go on, of course, for a Saudi Aramco. And just for the viewers' sake, it'll be the prob probably the largest IPO in history. Uh, put some sort of number around it. You know, we're talking... Uh, Bigger than Apple. So, beg your pardon? Bigger than Apple. It makes Apple look <laughs> like a minnow. Well, exactly right, Carson. Yeah. And when you're thinking about this, you know, the Saudis are very conscious as far as what the long-term horizon is for oil. They're looking at diversification and, of course, their sovereign wealth. They've got a young economy, age group-wise, I think 60% under 30 years of age. So, you know, they're, they're conscious as far as the long-term projections and what they want to do for the better, betterment, of course, for the economy. Well, you could also argue that they've run out of options, and that's the one way to just bring in, bring in fresh, uh, exactly, fresh money. exactly. Uh, but that will, that will presumably then dictate policy, will it not, in a way that's never been done before? Because suddenly you've got a listed entity that's that's driving uh, policy decisions you at know, a high level. Well, exa exactly. Mm. You know what? I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, and again, covering on what we discussed last week, as mm. far as you know, the Arab Spring and what happened, as far as you know, the the Middle East as a whole. I think there'll be many other countries across that whole basin following suit. I think it'll just be a wait and see what happens with Saudi Aramco, and then you'll be the likes of what happens in Libya. Where does the Iraqis go as far as oil? And, and of course, Iran. And then you, there are many other suppliers all the way across Africa. So I think it'll be just a, a, a normal course of events over the next decade. OK, panel, thoughts waiting on this one? Any, any further thoughts? Yeah. Well, some very big changes going on in, in Saudi Arabia at the moment. People know a lot more about this than me, but you've got the, the long-standing oil minister there who's been a, a core part of that yeah, OPEC consortium, Al Mami, standing down, yeah. and the Saudi Aram Aramco CEO coming into that role, who's going to bring a very commercial background to him, because for all of its faults, Saudi Aramco is widely admired as a very well-run sure. Uh, oil business. So it, 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 that dynamic is very interesting to me. And I think these changes that we're seeing, a changing of the guard at the political level yeah. in the, the royal family, uh, uh, they're, they're things that I think we're going to look back on in five or ten years' time and say that was a real swing point. Game I don't changer. know what it means, right. but. <laughs> well, Peter, well, Peter well, on that very question that Steve poses, is there any implication at all, though, when, the, when rubber hits the road with the attitude towards Iran? Because there you have the neighbour despised and on any kind of an output consensus, the view's always been, unless Iran's at those talks, sitting opposite us, looking at the whites of our eyes, no deal. Uh, well, what, what changes there? Well, I think it's very much, Carson, there's only one agenda as far as Iran's situation, and they want to increase production. Right. And, as, and, and as each month rolls on, that will happen, and I don't think they're going to be held it's accountable right. by the Saudis, or certainly OPEC, mm -hmm. and their whole agenda is to raise balance sheet, to be more profitable, and of course, they want to see a higher oil price. They're really there trying to stimulate it back can you above have both? 45 Can, can you achieve 50. both, though? Can you, can you pump to your heart's content plus uh, put the price up? It seems almost you're pulling on, opposite, on two different levers. Well, I think you'll maintain, I mean, what happens with the US dollar moving forward as far as Yellen? Are we going to see another rate rise? And I think where we're sitting at the moment, that where the Iranians are concerned, they've got very, very strong strategic partnerships with China, of course, and they're big exporters to that market. So they just want to keep price at this sort of level or higher and, of course, keep the, you know, the spigots open and just massive. Uh, production, you know, three and a half to four and a half million barrels a day. Pete, thank you as always. Appreciate it. Thank you, Carson.